Everyone quiet. Sounds like we have a visitor approaching. Hello, fellow traveler. You look tired. We're on a long road trip and stopped here to set up camp. You're welcome to rest here for the night. There's always room around our fire. So have a seat. The food's hot, the drinks are cold, the fire is warm, and the stories, hopefully, are scary. I'm Jeremy, and I'm the driver on these road trips we take, but for the night, I'll be your storyteller. So settle in for some stories from the road. Tonight's story is called The Night Watchman. This is a story from way back when I was in graduate school in Nashville. I wasn't one of the fortunate few that got a funded research admission, and so I always found myself searching for local part-time opportunities. These were neatly pipelined with other structured internships, and life was good for the most part. I lived in a small studio apartment and managed to starve myself into a savings account. The slew of friends around me in class gave me good company, inviting me to movie nights and the odd hiking trips. Not every job I worked at was great, obviously. Some paid less than others, and some had worse, had the worst managers. The deceptive world of sales got me convinced. Uh, got me convinced old folks got me to convincing old folks into buying overpriced cameras they never needed. Aside from the guilt I caught myself with, I also couldn't really find time during the day uh, to work at remote consumer electronics stores. I was getting more involved in research around my second year, and I primarily lived off of free food that was offered during featured seminars and other meetings on campus. So after a good deal of thought, I realized that I needed to find a part-time overnight job. I wasn't sleeping much as a graduate student, and so I might as well get paid for it, right? The next morning, I looked through entries on, the, on Craigslist and found one that said part-time overnight weekend guard job in Nashville and it paid around $15 an hour. Although I was hoping for a longer lasting job, this sounded like a good catch because I wasn't required to carry arms and I'd be getting nearly $400 for just sitting around at night. Hoping to not lose my spot, I immediately replied to the post giving my name, age, and phone number. Around lunchtime that day, I got a lazy text message saying, meet me at 6 p.m. today, Burke Building by the bus station. Downtown Nashville is, fam is a famously serene place compared to the other downtown areas in the United States. At least this is the impression I got from mates who used to live there. Excited, I packed up some food and took the bus from campus, reaching just before sunset. I found the apartment building I was looking for, though there was no sign of activity and the front, uh, front gate was padlocked. It was a humble red brick building that would have probably housed under 10 families. I waited by the stairs, eager to get started. After all, I wanted every dollar I could get. Seemingly an hour later, a withered old lady slowly walked up the road to find me drowning in a well of boredom. Are you here for the job? She said, almost begging for a response. Yeah, what's up with this place, I said, trying to hide my anger. Clearly the place was dead and nobody was around. There must have been some reason for guarding it. She unlocked the door and pushed her way in. I followed her with patience. The hallway in the first floor seemed cramped. A dusty reception desk stood beside a single dark elevator on the left and a rustic staircase directly in front of me. A locked door presented itself next to a row of mailboxes on the right. This is your room, she said, struggling to open it. There was a bad fire here a few weeks back. Some kitchen on the second floor. They closed down the place and the people here left. One guy on the third floor said he'd come by this weekend. William, um, Davis. William Davis. His stuff's still around, I think. He hasn't been in Nashville this year. Gone to Germany or France or something. You gotta wait around for him. Help him move if you like. She smirked. Fetching a torchlight from her bag, she walked into the dark room. I followed her quietly, reminding myself, two nights, $360. She opened a creaky wooden cupboard on the far corner to find, uh, to find some clothing. She found me a dark blue shirt, a damaged ID tag, 
a flashlight, and some gloves. Handing me a pair of sealed battery packs, she said, use them on that lamp. You got a book or something you could read? I nodded, showing her the enthusiasm of a chronically bored cat. Ostensibly drained by all this, she started walking to the front door. Turning one last time, she handed me a spare set of keys. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Oh, and there's a mart a few blocks down the road, I think, if you want to get something to eat. All right. Left alone, I felt an amalgam of emotions. Just thinking about the reception I got made me livid. She made me wait for more than an hour and didn't even ask my name. Well, if you don't like it, leave tomorrow morning and you're still a good $200 better than today, I said out loud. I switched on the desk lamp and positioned myself slowly on the weekly cushion chair. I pulled out my phone and noticed a fading, crumbling screen looking back at me. I had no confidence that my phone would last the night with only 24% charge remaining. The cluttered room was dark and the heat from the lamp kept me warm. Within minutes, my eyes adjusted to the blackness. The sharp corners of the surrounding furniture grabbed my attention. The broad window, uh, the broad window sill to my left hosted a conference of files, clips, and dead plants. The dirty, smudged glass functioned as a portal to the bustling streets of downtown. The night's still young, I thought, bathing in the tranquility of solitude. I realized the tiredness of my legs. I pulled out a copy of Mistborn, The Final Empire, and slowly settled down, heaving a sigh of fatigue. <clears throat> I need a girlfriend, I thought to myself. It was almost 1 a.m. and my depression was settling in. This, was, uh, this always happened when I read books. Characters in the fictional world made me both jealous and sad. Misery loves company, and I certainly felt miserable. My friends in grad school were mostly engaged or married, and here my life felt like a string of pointless jobs. As I lay there contemplating, an indescribable stench present, uh, presented itself, almost extolling my brain of thought. It was as though my brain couldn't decide if I wanted a commanding sneeze or a nauseating vomit but I immediately stood up and ran to the door. I brashly pushed, uh, pushed the a flimsy door open, coughing my way out. There was a man standing in front of me, aghast. He was a strapping, middle-aged middle -aged guy, easily six feet tall, wearing a brown leather jacket. Um, huh? I said, filling the air with confusion. Hey, are you the security guard? He said, yeah, are you Mr. Davis? I said, breathing heavily. He nodded firmly. So, Miss Colton told you about me. I'm here to get my stuff. I've parked, I've parked my truck down the road, he said. After a rigid handshake, give me a sec. This place stinks, I said. I walked uh, up to the door and slightly opened it. The repugnant stench was hardly noticeable. Surprised, I turned around and beckoned him to enter. He followed me into the security room. I handed him a flashlight, and I picked up the lamp. We don't have any electricity here. We've got to use the stairs. I said, wearing my gloves. That shouldn't be a problem. I only live in the second floor, he declared. Second floor? I speculated, reviving my memories. All right, let's go. We walked up the apparently archaic staircase. Every step caused an intensive creak, squeak, and groan. Grating, grating dust filled the air and William let out a jarring sneeze. I could swear he shook the whole building. A few steps later, I was startled by the very uh, distinct and clear thump coming from directly above. This was, was followed soon after by another th uh, much louder thump. I looked back at William with complete shock. His face would, was pale. I could hear my heart beating. Both of us ran back down the stairs, shaking with terror. Hello? I yelled. The crash. Uh, I yelled. The crashing sounds escalated. Both Will and I were pointing our lights at the staircase, case, breathing heavily. It felt like every thud resonated with my thrashing heart. 
With a sudden crash, a large sofa chair slid down and landed on the side of the stairs. I shrieked with panic and jumped backwards. The crash landing caused a violent dispersion of dust. Damn it! Will cried with annoyance. I took a few steps back and tried to calm my senses. I was completely befuddled by the large piece of furniture that fell down the stairs. We waited for the dust to settle. Do you really want to get your stuff now? I pleaded. I'm already here, he said. It was almost another 20 minutes before I stopped shaking. I looked at my watch and then at Will. He nodded at me and we decided to walk up. It was getting late and neither of us wanted to be there. We walked up the stairs, one step at a time, and reached the second floor. There were four doors in front of us, two to the right and two to the left. Which one's yours? I asked. The last one on the right, he said. The air on the second floor was oppressively muggy compared to the floor below. We walked swiftly to the end of the hallway. The white door on the right had a rusty badge. Apartment 204, I said. Will pulled out his keychain and fiddled around until he found the right key. He opened the large door, revealing a wide living room. We walked in together, scanning the surroundings. I was growing flustered by the smell emanating from the room. Let me see what we can take, Will stated. I walked up to the end of the living room and pulled up the blinds. I was able to see the empty road below. Freedom. Soon, I thought, trying to stay calm. There were a few assorted sofa chairs next to us, all facing a television. A vacuum cleaner, an ironing board, and a shoe stand stood on the far corner. The carpet on the floor felt rough and sticky. I surveyed the room with my lamp, identifying objects around me. I noticed tonal intricacies in the walls. The living room seemed alright, but the walls by the front door looked heavily damaged. Distinct tears that almost looked like scratch marks, marks bedecked the wall leading up to the kitchen. The accident was just a few weeks back. The walls here seem heavily damaged. It has to be this apartment, I thought. Will was searching through boxes in the closet next to me. The closet looked pristine in comparison to the rest of the house. I walked up to the kitchen noticing photo magnets on the fridge. The fridge itself was mostly charred and rusty. The magnets were even less colorful. I was looking for a sign. Anything that would get me, give me clues on Will's life here. My eyes darted towards the cabinet door above the sink. There was something unique about this door. The handle looked predominantly unscathed. I opened the door slowly, trying not to make a sound. My eyes sharpened as I observed a photograph stuck on the inside. It was a picture of William, standing on a cliff. I wanted to inquire about this photo, but I stopped myself. I saw Will floating past me again and into the bedroom. <laughs> I might need two trips. This mattress still looks good, he said. I followed his voice and walked in, finding Will staring at a single large king-size bed. The bed was creamy white with really no sign of use. There was a dressing table to the right revealing a gathering of perfumes and lotions. Will was searching through drawers trying to find something. I was growing increasingly suspicious. I did not really know who he was and I did not know if someone died here. I turned around and walked back into the kitchen. I wanted to find more artifacts. I must have been drunk or at least critically hungry because the cabinet looked different. The kitchen was structurally the same, but the cabinet had no doors. I was stunned by the complete lack of stock presented by the darkness in front of me. I stood there for a minute, convincing myself I was tired. The longer I stayed there, the more dazed I felt. I was breathing heavily now. I strolled past the sofas and towards Will. I spotted a door on the opposite bedroom. The doorknob looked stale and felt cold. I pushed open the worn slab of wood. I could swear my heart stopped. Standing there in front of me was a woman. She was wearing a red sleep shirt and staring right at me. The light from my lamp revealed her burnt face. Her head was severely scalded. Her eyes were certainly dead. She was holding what appeared to be a green detergent bottle in one hand and a kitchen torch in the other. 
I could hear my heart beating. I felt fear down in my spine, and I was visibly sweating. I fell to my knees and froze, gasping for breath. I started shivering. I felt an icy grip around my neck, and I was gawking at the tiled floor. I couldn't move. I felt suffocated. My eyes were closed. I suddenly felt roused. I was aware of my surroundings, and I caught myself standing. I was staring at Will. He was looking through files in a clearly random trunk. I looked at the tall mirror by the dressing table. What? What am I holding? I asked myself, altogether horrified. I was sauntering towards uh, Will. I knew I wasn't controlling myself. My face was gravely stinging, but I couldn't scream. I raised my left leg and kicked Will in the head. His forehead slammed against the handle on the trunk and he fell flat. I saw myself clumsily pouring a yellowish-green liquid from a bottle I was holding. Utterly frightened, I closed my eyes. I wailed. Sunlight beamed at me from the left. I looked at my watch. 7.30? What the... I thought. I hopped up quickly. My head hurt, and I was starting uh, standing in a dusty room wearing a dark blue shirt. I grabbed my bag and walked out. I noticed the musky reception desk in front of me. I was shaking. I felt cold. I pulled out my phone and with extreme consternation I pulled out my phone with extreme consternation. 16% charge, I gasped. I disrupted my bag trying to find the strips of paper Miss Colton gave me. My eyes widened with fear. I found a photograph. All right, so that was the Night Watchman. Uh, again, that one was uh, author unknown on that one. Um, hope you enjoy this one. And uh, again, as always, if you have any stories to suggest, just uh, holler at me on either of my social medias or drop me a line at fullmoonemptyroad at gmail.com. And um, if you are trying to decide on something to uh, to suggest for me to read, you can also head on over to uh, Bonfire, uh, head on over to my Bonfire and uh, pick up a shirt. Um, I think the links are posted on my social media, and I can't remember the, remember what it is right off the top of my head. It's like bonfire.com slash store slash full dash moon dash empty dash road. And uh, yeah, so uh, hope everybody enjoyed, and uh, hope everyone... Uh, no, not I already said that. Hope everybody enjoyed. Uh, have you know? Let's keep that fire burning low. Good night, everyone.